Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're continuing our dialogue on different views of American civil society with leaders of the Hayward Burns Institute. And rather than me trying to describe what you all do at the Hayward Burns Institute, I'm going to uh, to kick it over to you, uh, Chaka Burroughs, Samantha uh, Mellerson, and Michael Finley. You are three of, three of the leaders of the Institute. Uh, Chaka, could you take it away and just give us a give us your take on American civil society, some of the challenges that we're facing, and how we can address those challenges in a way that uh, strengthens us as a country and and brings people together and talks about real issues. Yes. Uh, so at the Hayward Burns Institute, we've been working for the last twenty one years to address one of the real structural issues and barriers to advancing our society, our civil society, which is, you know, structural, historical and institutional racism, the impact that it's had on communities of color, structural deficits that are really in place that were baked into our country's history that we just haven't had enough time and energy and willpower to address. It's been a part of you know, white supremacy. It's been a part of building, you know, wealth and power for the dominant uh, group in this country's history. And yet for so many, it's been a part of being subjected uh, to dehumanization to uh, when it comes to Native Americans, straight up genocide. And it's time that for us to, you know, really look at all of these issues and understand that we cannot advance and move forward uh, just acting like we've passed that. It's in the history. What we've been doing at the Burns Institute is trying to address how these structures and these history is still living today and manifests itself through uh, the administration of justice and have been working in that area, realizing that actually this is not just a one area thing. This is structural across sectors. And so now more and more we're looking at the impact of that history, uh, those barriers to the you know all of us really in this society but specifically communities of color and communities that have been othered and cast aside and thinking about how we build structural well-being that really centers folk who have been uh marginalized in that way samantha could you give us your take <laughs> sure um, I mean, just to build off of Shaka, I think we understand that the role that structural racism plays in our current societal fabric, just the uh, really beginning to examine, identify the evil genius nature of it, right? It, we oftentimes think about the negative impacts that we all have seen as a result of structural racism, but we often downplay kind of the genius side of it, the design, the intricate nature of it, how it taps into all of these different institutions that are interlocking that then impact culture and um, outcomes. And so we know that if we're going to be effective in dismantling that, we have to replace it with something. And so we have created what we call structural well-being, which is truly the flip. It's keeping the genius design, that intricate nature, but all working towards our well-being collectively and individually. So we kind of define this as a system of public policies, institutional inclusive practices, cultural representations, and all the other norms uh, that really establish a sense of belonging and work to strengthen families, communities, and the individual well-being for positive life outcomes. So truly, that is what we are in service of. Positive life outcomes. Michael, you want to give us your take? I think it's, it's, it's the same. It's similar. And what we're trying to do in the work, when Tim talks about moving towards structural well-being, the work we want to do, we all got to start talking, right? And so our whole process is how do we bring folks together and folks who don't always agree, who are not always aligned, who might question even the language of structural racism, and white supremacy. Why are we saying that? And our point is not to do this to be provocative and just to get people excited. It's to say, no, these are the foundations and pillars of how this country was built. But how do we break it apart, right? How do we use data? How do we redefine what that looks like to have real conversations? These are emotional issues, right? These are things that we literally talk about in our homes and with our friends. How do we normalize those conversations but make them constructive towards something, which is towards dismantling white supremacy? in a real tangible way, not just words, right? But how do we look at these systems and structures, 
be, be, you know, be guided by what the data says, be guided by what those closer to the issues are talking about and what they believe are the solutions. And now we put them all in a room, in a room to actually develop new policies, new practices, new structures. The thing that I think that is so very interesting about American history is if you look back, um, it, the colonization of, of uh, North America and Central America in particular, South America as well, was really about the expansion and the and the ambition of European powers. When you're talking about Spain and Portugal and England and France and so on, right? These these uh, places were trying to expand economically throughout the world, and then there were also marginalized groups within their society that were seeking freedoms, and and that's that became part of uh, American history. Then they come into contact with native societies, whether in Central and uh, South America, the the uh, Aztec and other Mayan and other um, indigenous nations. And in that clash, uh, one side gets destroyed, overcome, and then uh, eventually there, there's an attempt to um, to uh, integrate um, and uh, those cultures into a European defined culture, whether through religion or through uh, institutional practices. And we saw the same thing here in in America and North America as well. So if you take a look at that sort of background and you bring it up to today, how do you see that background, Samantha, informing how that sort of structure, right? Because that's what you're talking about. You're talking about a, a real rooted kind of kind of system that goes back into our history for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then, of course, you know, you add into that the mix of various waves of migration, slavery, and and uh, and forced migration. Um, how do you see us addressing that when we can't even, in our educational institutions, agree that we're supposed to teach that uh, those parts of histories? How do you, how do how do we get there? Because this is not a, an issue of people who are black talking with each other or people who are Latin Hispanic just talking. It's, there's got to be across barrier uh, dialogue. How do you see that, Samantha? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the, um, is one to never assume that folks actually understand the depth of that history as you just laid out. That is a really important factor. And while it is difficult to teach in schools at this time and other legislative things that we see happening, Unfortunately, within our daily dialogues, we can engage in these conversations. Families can, friends can, folks should be engaging in the discussion around this history and, and truly examining what does it look like, this the, the following of this kind of pedagogy of the oppressed, right? How we've continued to repeat these cycles over and over again. And I think ultimately what we try to remind folks of is, is to truly like center our humanity, to get back, recenter ourselves in seeing each other as people, seeing ourselves in each other, um, in having a dialogue that, that goes so far beyond kind of the political tensions that are at play, but truly addressing issues that we all know we have in common. We want our children to be okay. We want our families to be okay. We want to have uh, enough that we can all, you know, take advantage of opportunities and work hard and prosper. But these these are very real across all of the distinctions and the different cultures that we've named is truly at, at heart. Like we need to recenter our humanity and, and, and really start from there. How do you, Michael, how do you talk with somebody who doesn't have your vocabulary yet, right? So we're talking about this issue um, and we share a common vocabulary. We don't we don't necessarily have identical experiences, but we share a common vocabulary. When you say that there's systemic systemic racism and you're talking to a white guy, right? What you're basically saying is you're part of the problem and your European ancestors created this system that we suffer from. How do you how do you bridge that gap? How do you how do you get somebody who doesn't necessarily have that historical context to actually get beyond the barrier of a word systemic or, you know, or the accusatory nature of this? How do you do that? Yeah, your question is, how do we get past the blame game, right? People feeling like they're being blamed if they want to run out of their room. Yeah. And I think part of this is for us, um, there's a slide we always use to fishbowl. When we say white supremacy, we talk about that people of color don't own white supremacy. White people own white supremacy. We are all in the fishbowl. We are all the fish breathing this 
every single day, all of us, right? And so whether you're sort of the oppressor or the oppressed, however you see yourself, you're being harmed by this, right? And so our conversation is to bring people in the room in a way where we're not attacking people individually. This is about systems and structure. And actually there's a benefit when you... Your sound just went out, uh, Michael. Um, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over to uh, Chaka. Chaka, how do you how do you? Uh, and we'll see whether we can we can fix that that sound issue. Um, take a look at your at your uh, sound controls on the bottom of your of your Zoom. Chaka, um, how do you see? Because I mean, there is a little bit of you know even in Michael's answer, right? We get a little bit of this um, oppressor and oppressed. Oppressor generally has intent to impress the oppressed. What happens if I have no intent? Right, I'm just living my life. I I, I was born. I was taught certain things. How do mm -hmm. how, how do I deal with that? I mean, we try to uh, engage people from different angles on these things because, especially around racism, structural racism, oppression, hierarchy, there's a very high level of sensitivity. And so, you know, we're not trying to act like, hey, just because we introduced this conversation, that sensitivity is gone. Similarly, though, we think must think about other paradigms that we're involved in. So if you think of the about the environment, we don't decide we're not the king of the environment. We should understand we thought we were for a long time. We would just demolish the earth, reap all the resources and benefits from whatever kind of relationship that was us basically as humans being in power over the environment. And what we've learned is that there's high cost for that, right? And to understand that similarly, how we treat each other, the idea of dominating people, dominating the other group, it can, you could become othered and be a part of receiving that domination in this framework. So no one is free from it. It's not benefiting us. And when we actually dig into history, we talk about history from different perspectives so people can understand that these practices had detrimental impacts across the spectrum of humanity. So it what you're saying is once it becomes systematized, I don't have to have any intent, right? In other it's, words, it, it's the nature of that in, institution. It's the it's baked into it that the intent is just you go to work. So, so in the justice talk about generational wealth, okay? Let's say you're native and basically the basis of your wealth hundreds of years ago was destroyed, right? The, the, um, how you interacted with the land, whatever possessions you had, whatever cultural heritage you have, it, it was it was basically destroyed. Your, your uh, great grandfather went to a boarding school, your grandfather went to a boarding school, and then the boarding schools were closed, right? Basically, I don't have to have any intent anymore to be living within a situation where my culture is advanced and somebody else's culture was systematically destroyed. Is that, is that the idea, Samantha? It's, it's not about my intent. It's just right. the system is, carries, carries the DNA of that origin. Exactly. And we have a responsibility to sharpen our ability to see that. And so, you know, I loved how you framed the question when we're having conversations with you know, for example, white men in leadership positions who feel they're being blamed. I mean, I think the first part of that conversation is saying, oh, man, no, listen, this is way bigger than you, right? Like, this is so much bigger than one or two individual leaders. It's it's why we've seen even the diversification of leadership positions across human, the human service sector, for example, across the country, but it's producing the same disparate outcomes. Well, it's not because the, the leaders of color are, also have an intention to harm children of color. No, it's not that at all. It is the structure and it's our responsibility to step back outside of ourselves and really understand how these structures are at play, these interlocking systems of social control, really, and suppression and how that's playing out, how that is delivering disparate outcomes across communities of color. Uh, Michael, does your, is, your, is your microphone working again? I'm hoping so. I just wanted, yes, to, add one, yes. I just wanted to add one other thing. And so the beauty of when we walk people through the history, I think part of what we found, it actually has become a tool of disarming people because people can feel like whether you're white, whether you're African-American, whether you're Latino, you can sit in there and see it. I don't have to feel personally attacked. And like Sam and Shaka said, we sort of, we want to make that not comfortable, 
We want to normalize. This is what it is. We're all in this, all of us, right? right. And so there's ways that we we highlight that that I think works for folks. One of the things that 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 you know, generation after generation. So uh, my kids are multi everything, right? Uh, orientation, race, and blah blah blah, right? So they look at me and they they look at the past. They look at the culture that I consumed in the past. And they say, you know, dad, that's that's pretty racist stuff. Right. And then you look at something like uh, Blazing Saddles and you say that couldn't be made today. Right. Which is a commentary on racism. I mean, racism and and all these ways of, of, of interacting today. How do you deal with that idea that, you know, the the first um, uh Oscar uh, awarded to an African American woman was awarded for a uh, a depiction of of an era that is fundamentally uh, racist and very um, sort of backward looking with with uh, uh, you know uh, a a uh, gauzy uh, uh, patina, right? Um, how do you deal with with that whole idea of constantly redefining who we are? And looking back in a way that that allows us to look forward and be different, Chaka, you you want to you want to take a cut uh, on that because, as you said, if we're all in the fishbowl, we're all part of this calculus. We're all part of the system, whether we want to be or not. Right? Even those fighting against the system in the past have fought in a way that today our kids have defined as being the wrong path. Yes, as human beings, we are complex. And so there's never going to be a plateau that we've reached. There's going to be a constant pushing and reevaluating the younger generation kind of questioning things. And I think that that's going to continue and we should lean into it. You know, um, if you think, you know, I, I use the I use metaphors a lot of times to kind of illustrate for people in other sectors of our lives how these things happen. So if you think about gas guzzling cars killing the planet, right? The first reform on that was just squeezing a few more miles out of the gallon of gas that was still going to cause us to have CO2 and, and greenhouse effects. So the next real big step was let's put a big battery in that and get as many miles as we can. But all of these were uncomfortable. So the first one was like, well, you're going to ruin the car. You're trying to make it, the the, the, the engines are going to be weak. And well, now there's a hybrid. Oh, the hybrid. I, you know, there was always this kind of like, that's uncomfortable. And lithium Until, mining for the batteries yeah, is destroying the issue. Plant, yes. Right? And so it's like, you're, you're seeing that each time we're trying to do better, yet we identify that there's a new problem that we have to solve. So in human services and in our relationship to each other on this planet, it is no different. These younger generations are identifying the model that we've built and are saying, yes, that works well. This does not. And this was out of pocket. You shouldn't have been doing that. And so <laughs> there's a big pushback and there will continue to be that because that we have to get in the right relationship with each other and the environment or we will not survive. So it's not really an option as we think it is. That's the that's the mystery of it is we think we have a choice on this, but we really don't. We we are a part of this planet, how we treat each other, how we relate to each other, how we relate to power, power over the environment. All of these things have to be reevaluated. Our solutions are going to be then critiqued. And we should be open to that rather than I think as we get older, many of us get more critical of the changes and of the discomfort that comes with it. But it's really that opportunity to continue to innovate that we should lean into. So I, I really love that. Love what you're saying, uh, Chaka. I mean, you're t you're saying that we should be humble. We should we should understand that hubris is a risk that we all uh, face, no matter how sophisticated our analysis. It could be that our analysis or our actions um, actually have within them the seeds of of some critique that somebody can validly make uh, later on. Does that mean, Michael, that we should give each other a break and we should listen more and perhaps lecture less? Yeah, ideally, if we were listening more, I mean, I think that's the right we're trying to it, the work is to have people in space to be able to hear each other. You have to build trust to do that, that all that history you just talked about, the way that we can all just say it 
that is people's lives every moment that you carry with you in the space that you carry with you even into the meetings that we're in right you're and you come with your perspective and so yeah the work is how do we hear each other but and part of that honestly mark is how do we see each other and that's why when sam says centering humanity we really mean that not in just some like we saw we're all happy let's do whatever but in a real, like, I need to see you, Mark. I don't know you. What's, what is, what, what are things hanging on you? Cause we're about to be in a meeting to talk about decisions that impact people's lives. And it's laughable that we think we should know each other a bit more at the end before we can make those decisions about people, right? So all we're trying to do is curate space to create that listening, create the opportunity to hear each other and see each other differently. So Samantha, let's let's start. Let's talk about some of the practical work uh, that uh, the uh, Burns Institute does, um, and then let's talk about um, it, as we close out. Uh, let's also talk about what we should be doing as a society to heal at 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 a at a uh, in in ways that themselves that 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 healing does not create more destruction, right? More division. So, uh, Samantha, could you just describe what, if, if you take a look at your metrics of success, like how do you know that your programs are successful? And then let's talk a little bit about those programs themselves. Sure. Um, thank you. And I, I think part of it is in our work, we enter into places and I think Shaka mentioned earlier, it, we don't squarely fit into one particular sector. We re we really look at the root causes of the issues that we're talking about. And in order to solve for those problems, we have to have a cross-sector um, sampling of people, of leadership, of a community at the table and engaging in dialogue. And it's so interesting, uh, you know, one of the things that we do first off when we bring groups together is really to establish some shared values. And it can sound kind of corny to folks. Oh, yeah, there they are. But it's actually pretty profound to move a service structure away from being so results driven. Results are important. Data is important. We lift that up. But to actually shift to be values driven, what does that mean? If we're actually in partnership, centering our values and making sure that whatever we're operationalizing is in alignment with our values, what kind of results does that drive? We haven't seen that before. We haven't seen values driven sectors, human service approaches to the work. We should, but we haven't in the past. Some of what we do, you know, when Mike said, getting folks to see each other and see themselves in each other is we'll just establish some working agreements, some group norms. Okay, guys, so we're going to talk about some really sensitive issues. There's going to be a lot of uh, ways that we may impact each other in this conversation. I may have a reaction to something that you're saying that doesn't feel good. How am I going to address that? What do we want to do? How do we want to address things when either I feel super offended by something that you said, or if I inadvertently offend you by something that I said, how would I like to be addressed in that? And really establishing some group norms so that we, it's okay to have conflict. Conflict doesn't have to be a bad thing. It, it can actually spark tre tremendous innovation. And what does it look like to lean into that? Let's name those distinctions. Let's be able to see each other. When we ask folks to introduce themselves around the room, we don't ask for their titles and affiliations, just your name. We're just people. Come into partnership. A, a CEO of, a, of an uh, organization serving community can participate in the conversation just like the grandmother from the community that is leading with the tremendous historical knowledge that needs to be centered in that in that conversation. So, so much of what we do is almost act as a bridge to bring folks in partnership together to really be able to center themselves in the conversations and to see each other in a way that goes beyond the normal tensions that we see, but to truly be anchored in a way that they can engage in meaningful conversation towards solutions that will be driven from a sense of community and those shared values that we need. I, I love what you're saying in terms of it's not all about metrics. I, I live in a metrics world, mm -hmm. right? So when we deal with um, um, homelessness, we're talking about how many people are housed when we're dealing with poverty, when we're dealing with art, right? How many people experience the art and what type of art is experienced? There's a lot of metrics driven, but what you're saying is that we also need to pay a lot of attention to the process by which we achieve the metrics, yeah. right? The sensibility, the culture, right, Chaka? Um, we're talking about basically imbuing what we do with respect, with communication, with uh, equity, 
right? But equity not along necessarily um, defined by race. It could also be defined by position within an organization, right? Position within a community or self-definition, right? As as Samantha said, right, that 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 grandmother is sitting next to that CEO, right? Um, Chaka, how do you see as you as you deliver this type of 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 experience, who are you delivering it to and who do you want to deliver it to? Are you delivering it to the people that you feel really need to experience what you have to convey? Or are you basically taking the constituencies that are most um, approachable? You know, that's a great question. We, for the longest time, worked with jurisdictions that were really centered in the justice realm. And so they were either there because they were told they wanted to be there. They were passionate about the issue, indifferent. I mean, the full range of entry points for individuals. But and a low so bar part, entry because they already were kind of in, in your space, right? And they, it's part of their work on some level, except our work, we would always engage community members, people who are directly impacted by these issues, families had been through the system. So they're bringing a level of of personal experience and exposure into the space. And for us, it was always important to normalize that. We do a practice uh, called conocimiento, where we talk about our own history as people in your family. Like, what's your family history? Which in this country, we're a historical mark. So most people don't really share much about their own family history, which makes it easier to just not acknowledge history in general. When we then share our history, we open up and we can connect as people. Um, fundamentally to the, the metrics you're looking for at the end of the day, which you know we work for metrics to address racial and ethnic disparities over 300 jurisdictions, so we understand that. We're building relationships, Mark, with people. Relationships help you sustain a disagreement about your worldview. So you can have a relationship with me and we can see the world differently and still hear each other. So for us, understanding that that becomes a metric that is often overlooked. How do you build meaningful relationships in professional settings with people who are sometimes adversely, you know, opposed to the positions that each other are taking? Um, and then still build relationship in that context. Uh, that, that To me, that is so profound because you've got two things going on, right? You strip away all the stuff, right? You strip away our gender, our orientation, our race, our age, our ability or disability. You strip that away. You just have the essential person. Then you add it all back because that is who we are, Right. And you have to kind of what you're saying, Chaka, is that you you kind of have to be able to deal with with both. In other words, see each other as people stripped away from all the other stuff and then see each other within the context in which we grew up. Right. Right, Michael. I mean, it's it's a really complicated thing. And then that that is all bound together by respect and listening and process and, and learning yeah, and that history gives the context. But Mark, and it's 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 hard because we're people, but it's also interesting in our lives. If I, if you if you're like, hey, I'm going to buy a new refrigerator, what would you do? You'd probably do a little bit of research on refrigerators, figure out what to get good reviews, you'll get information, you'll go to a place, you'll talk to people who experience about refrigerators. I mean, there's things we do in our regular life that what we're saying is why we need to apply that same sort of processing processes to this work to get people in the rooms to be able to use data, to be able to use information to guide how we do what we do the work. But, and the context is, the history gives us the context of why we're where we are. And centering humanity in our, in our approach of going to achieve structural being is to say, you know, we actually, there are these pieces you know, that we need to invest in anchoring trust, getting all of us around the table to make those changes. But the changes are not to hurt people. And part of what we're trying to bring people in is to see how we actually all benefit because we're all in that fishbowl, white supremacy dealing with structural racism. The fix is actually what at the end of the day will actually benefit all of our families, all of the people, all of us as citizens. And that kind of gets me back to when you asked about civil society and what we're trying to do. Well, that that idea of being safe and discussing controversial issues is is so important. It it binds together so much of what of what you're you're all talking about. And also that there isn't just one perspective, right? This is a perspective. 
there are other perspectives as well that that can be shared in that conversation. And that's what you're talking about. You're talking about a willing to assert and a willingness to listen to others' assertions as well, and then have that sort of respectful, informative, interesting, effervescent dialogue, which is part of American civil society. Chaka Burroughs, Samantha Mellison, and Michael Finley of the Hayward Burns Institute, thank you so much for informing us of your work. It's just been a real honor to have you all here, and and I so very much appreciate uh, your sharing with me and helping to inform and educate me. Really appreciate it.